Welcome to Stab the Dragon. We're looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Still, this will be the, the seventh part of the series I've called The Need of the Hour. Today, we'll look at the final phrase of this verse. And the title is, God will hear, forgive, and heal. So in the last few months, we've been studying just this one verse. And the big idea that I'm pursuing is that America has fallen. We've collectively gone over the cliff. The collapse is now upon us, and there's no turning back until we hit bottom, or if God intervenes. This Bible study is the prelude to a study of American history, culture, and politics that I want to do. But what America needs first and foremost is a heaven-sent, Christ-centered, spirit-led, Bible-based, Reformation-sized revival. The need of the hour is a mass repentance and turning to Christ. Learning our history as Americans is important, and I do hope to get into that. But first, we need to acknowledge that where we are spiritually is not a good place. Politics and economics are important, certainly, but that's not where we start. They flow downstream from the spirit of a nation, from the faith of a nation. The faith of a people produces their culture, produces their politics and economics. We live in a dark, evil time, but there's still hope. And I bring this to you on Thursday, June 23rd, 2022, just days away, I believe, from yet another round of massive communist-inspired writing across our nation as the Supreme Court prepares to release its decision on Roe v. Wade. These riots will rival the George Floyd riots of 2020. Though I believe that we have gone over the cliff, I also think that Christ is here now and, his, and the hope that we have lies in Him alone. The hope that America has is in Christ alone. Yes, there's need for better politics, law and order, and I pray the Republicans win big in November, if that election actually happens. Yes, we need far better economic policies in this country. Yes, we need to learn the truth about our history. But it all starts with repentance and knowing Christ. So today's study is the final part of this famous verse from 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Today, we'll look at the key words in that final phrase and seek to make application. God hears the prayers of his people. He forgives sin, and he can heal his church and America. So first of all, God hears the prayers of his people. God says that then he will hear from heaven. Then, what does that mean? Based upon his people humbling themselves, based upon the, the prior portions of this verse, People have to humble themselves. They've got to pray to him desperately. They've got to seek his face, repent. Then he will hear from heaven. Now this final phrase just recaps and finishes everything that's preceded it. God hears the prayers of those who are called by his name, those who have a covenant relationship with him in Christ Jesus. God hears the prayers of his church. While God is omniscient and omnipresent, and therefore he hears the prayers of pagans, to their false gods, or he hears the cries and prayers of those who don't have a relationship with Christ, and yet they, they pray anyway. God hears the prayers of his beloved, those bought by the blood of Christ, in a very special way due to that covenant we have in Christ. God treats his people as his own children. When we pray, he is our Father, just as Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 our Father, who art in heaven. The word for hear is Shema, to listen attentively, give attention to, or to consider. God listens attentively to his children when they pray. There is clearly a special relationship uh, between God and King Solomon in this text, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, the Jewish remnant in the days of the chronicler. So too, there's a special relationship between God and the church today. So God pays attention to the prayers of his people. The world denies the special relationship between the church and God. 
The world believes that God owes everybody his ear. But from Genesis to Revelation, we see that God has a special relationship with his called out ones, his chosen ones, the descendants of Abraham, the people of Israel, and now those who are following Christ alone. In Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 10 through 12, he writes, They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. They have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant that I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing disaster upon them that they cannot escape. Though they cry to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they make offerings, but they cannot save them in the time of their trouble. There came a time when God refused to listen to the prayers of his people. He allowed them to hit rock bottom. War, economic disaster, captivity, plague, death, all came upon them suddenly. When God's people break the covenant, God's patience can eventually wear out and judgment or discipline will follow. We know that God allowed great disasters to fall on Israel, Judah, and Jerusalem. And only after 70 years of exile did the Jews get to return to Jerusalem. But they never again had a kingdom of their own that was close to what they had lost due to sin and idolatry. Repeated disobedience can still be forgiven, but the consequences may be long-lasting. Yes, God listens to the cries and prayers of his people, but sometimes it's a long while after the judgment phase has set in and much suffering has come. As believers in Christ, we know that the Holy Spirit hears our heart cries, our deep groanings of the Spirit. He knows our prayers before we voice them. He prompts us to pray. When God's people, the church, begin to really pray, it's at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. One of the first prayers we can pray is for the Spirit to lead us to pray. A prayer revival is a sign of God's grace upon His people. So we pray for a heart for prayer. Old time Baptists, of which I am one, used to have a prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. Now, not so much. We do have care groups or life groups uh, during the midweek, like Wednesday or Tuesday, Thursday, something like that. And these can and do have sweet times of prayer. Our church has some corporate prayer as uh, part of our monthly members meeting on Sunday afternoon, and that can be very beneficial. But in the old days, Baptist churches would schedule one or two uh, revival meetings per year, week-long events, sometimes two, uh, of preaching along with prayer meetings and evangelistic visitation campaigns as well. Sometimes it just seems to me that prayer may have had a bigger emphasis 50 years ago in the church's life. Charles H. Spurgeon, that famous Baptist pastor in England in the mid to late 1800s, had a huge Baptist church in London that would hold over 5,000 people. On Sunday mornings while Spurgeon preached, there was always a prayer meeting going on down in the boiler room where a hundred members would gather and pray while Spurgeon preached. The famous American evangelist Dwight L. Moody in the 1800s also would schedule prayer meetings in the cooperating churches of the cities where he would be holding a revival. Billy Graham, the world-renowned evangelist of the mid to late 20th century, also scheduled prayer meetings before and during his evangelistic crusades. God uses the prayers of his people to help bring about his will on earth. God hears the prayers of those who earnestly call out to him in repentance and faith. If the thief on the cross can turn to Jesus and with his dying breath ask for Jesus to remember him and Jesus tells him, this day you shall be with me in paradise, then we too can pray with confidence that God hears and answers prayer. An application. If we're honest with ourselves and look at our hearts, our thinking, our affections and behavior, and we compare ourselves to what we see in Christ, in Scripture, we'll see that we always have a big need to repent and seek Christ. We'll see our need for prayer. Are we just praying for physical well-being? Well, there's nothing wrong with praying for physical well-being, and these days we need that more and more, it seems. But we do need to pray for a heart for holiness, for a love of Christ. 
a love for obeying Him. We should be praying for revival to hit our churches. Pray for revival to spread across America so America wakes up to our sinfulness and to turn to Christ. Pray for our politicians to have their worldviews turned upside down, changed into a biblical worldview. With the collapse coming upon us here in America, pray for a nationwide mourning over sin and a turning to Christ in repentance. Secondly, God forgives sin. God tells his people that if they humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways, he will hear from heaven and forgive their sin. This implies that the prayers of God's people are prayers of confession, confession of sin, prayers seeking forgiveness. God forgives those who are humble and repentant, who are earnestly seeking God's face. Our problem is that we're far from God because of sin, and the answer to that problem is repentance and being forgiven by God. But many times we have the wrong idea that it is simply God's job to forgive sin, essentially to wink at sin like a cosmic Santa Claus. We've lost the concept of the holiness of God and the awfulness of sin. We take our sin lightly and we take God's holiness lightly. Sin is violating God's law and God's law is the reflection of the holy perfection of his character, his righteousness. People tend to measure themselves against other people, saying, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so, or God knows my heart. That's a favorite. Yes, friend, God does know our hearts, and that's the problem, because our hearts are desperately wicked. We're far from God. But people say, don't judge me. But the standard is not how you feel. It's not how we each evaluate ourselves or even how other people evaluate us. The standard is always God's word. And the Bible says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands and no one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Romans 3, 10 through 12. The world and much of the church will say those words by Paul are too harsh and demeaning. They harm people's self-esteem. They're not winsome. The world wants to excuse sin by calling sins mistakes. That's not repentance. A mistake is when you go 2 plus 2 equals 5. The standard is what Jesus called the greatest commandment in Mark 12, 29 to 31. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord with all your heart, and with all your soul, and all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. You can also certainly look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, or the list of the sins and the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And anytime we look at these scriptures honestly, we see that we're sinners. God is holy, 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 and we're not. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 48, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There is absolutely no wiggle room there. The standard demanded by God is perfection, and we fail that standard. The standard is loving God with our whole being 24-7. None of us does that. The standard is loving our neighbor as ourselves. We don't do that. This means we're guilty before God, and guilt means we are worthy of his wrath and judgment, and we are in the need of forgiveness. But the good news, the gospel, is that God forgives sin. Now, how does forgiveness work? How does he do that? The Father sent the Son, Jesus, to earth as a complete human being to live a perfect sinless life of full obedience to his heavenly Father. Jesus was fully God and fully man. He had a human nature. Two natures in one person. Then Jesus preached and performed mighty miracles, recorded in the four Gospels, but he was betrayed, beaten, crucified, and buried. But what man meant for evil, God meant for good. And so Jesus was raised from the grave on the third day. Paul writes in Romans 3, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, to be received by faith. What this means is that sinners are justified, or made right with God, 
by God's grace alone. It's a gift from God. It's not something we can work for or earn by works. This grace comes to us by the redemption through Christ. Redemption is a ransom price paid by Christ with his blood that satisfies the holy wrath of God, propitiates the wrath of God, satisfies the righteous anger that God has toward us sinners. We can receive this redemption only by faith. This is a divine legal transaction whereby Jesus trades our guilt for his righteousness by dying on the cross in our place as our substitute. Because Jesus was a man, he could die for sinful men. Because he is the Son of God, fully divine, his righteousness and death can cover the sins of all those who come to him in faith. Forgiveness, then, is not cheap. It's not cost-free. It's provided by the life and death of the Son of God. This is not God winking at our sin. It is a divine legal transaction of entering into a covenant with God through Christ. When this passage from 2 Chronicles 7.14 speaks of God forgiving sin, this is how it all works out. This is what we should pray for. An application. This passage speaks to the individual believer because even after we're saved from sin and have entered into covenant with God, we are not yet perfected. Christians remain sinners. But we now have a new heart that longs to please, obey, and love God. We have the Spirit indwelling us, so we are empowered to overcome temptation and sin, yet we still have these fleshly bodies. We still live in the world, so we still sin. When we do sin, if we fail to repent and forsake our sin and harden our hearts, we can reap some bad consequences from those sins. Because God disciplines those whom he loves. He disciplines his children to conform us to his son's image. The consequences to our sin are intended to correct us and bring us back into obedience. So when we interpret this passage, we understand that God is always calling us to repentance and humility, always urging us to pray for deliverance from our sins and the consequences that we've brought upon ourselves. An application for the church in America, there must be a turning to God for forgiveness from the sins of the church. Too many churches have drifted into gross unbelief, unsound doctrine, heresy, and churches that have embraced the values of the world with their sexual ethics and gender roles that are far from Christ and under, under God's judgment. There needs to be a turning from those sins and seeking the Lord's forgiveness for decades of decadence. Many churches have forsaken the doctrine of salvation in Christ alone and have welcomed the heresy of universalism. These churches need to repent and seek the Lord's forgiveness. Even conservative churches like my own, SBC, have failed in many ways in the past hundred years, where we have failed to recognize the drift of our society towards communism, which is pure evil, and we have failed to look our politicians in the eye and say, this shall not pass. Point three, God can heal his church and America. What does the text mean when it says God will heal their land? The Hebrew word is rapha, meaning to mend, repair, cure, heal, or make whole. The use here in 2 Chronicles 7.14, then, is metaphorical, spiritual. It's looking at the nation as a whole as being sick and in need of healing. This tells us a bit about how God views sin. Sin is like a contagious disease that damages the body. It's infectious. It can lead to death. Leprosy is frequently used in Scripture as a metaphor for sin. Those infected with leprosy were called unclean. They were not allowed in the camp. In Exodus 15, the people had just been delivered from Pharaoh's army at the crossing of the Red Sea, but they were running out of water. When they arrived at the springs of Marah, the water was no good. It was bitter and undrinkable. So the people grumbled and complained against Moses. God then had Moses throw a log into the water, and the waters were changed into sweet, drinkable water. And then God said, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord your healer. Here we see a new name for God in the text. Jehovah Rapha, God the Healer. 
The idea then of Exodus 15 and 2 Chronicles 7.14 is similar. Listen to the Lord, obey him, and he will make sweet that which is bitter. He will heal your land. Isaiah 19 is a prophecy about Egypt. And verse 22 says, And the Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing, and they will return to the Lord, and he will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them. Egypt did not have a covenant with the Lord. They have been a pagan nation their entire history, first with the native religions of ancient Egypt and now with Islam. But there is a coming day when God will smite the Egyptians in such a way, sending his Holy Spirit to them so that they will repent and cry out to the Lord for mercy and be saved by the power of Jesus' blood. And here we see hope for America as well. God is in the business of healing sinful lands, sinful peoples, and a fallen sinful church. The great hope for America, or for any country, is not a political resurgence of conservatism, although that would certainly be a good thing, and I hope and pray that happens. But politics flows downstream from the spirit of the people, from their faith, from their religion. When God sends a nationwide revival, when we are convicted of our sins and repent and actively seek the Lord, crying out in humility and desperation, then the Lord can change our hearts, change our apostate churches, and change America, healing this sin-sick land. In conclusion, America is in free fall. We've gone over the cliff, heading into communism, socialism, totalitarianism, and complete failure and destruction because of sin. Many churches and denominations are apostate and the church in general has failed to do its job to be salt and light. We've allowed ungodly, unprincipled men to run the country into godless chaos and depravity. Our only hope is Christ. We must repent and seek God in every realm of our culture. We are even now under the judgment of heaven and are suffering and yet not turning to Christ. May God have mercy on us and send a great revival. This concludes this lengthy sermon series on 2 Chronicles 7.14, which serves as the introduction to a study of American history that I want to do. There'll be more sermons from Chronicles along the way and perhaps other passages as well because there are many Bible texts that pertain to our situation. In the meanwhile, pray for America. In hoc signo winkies. This is Stab the Dragon, out here.